OK, I, th I think it's recording. Maybe Cheryl, you want to double check me. There we go. All right, I see it. All right. Over Great. to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kirsten Rigney. I'm the legal director for the Bureau of Energy and Technology Policy at DEEP, and I am filling in for uh, Acting Deputy Commissioner De uh, Vicki Hackett, who is uh, ill today. So I don't know all of you, so it's very nice to meet you virtually, um, and thanks for joining us today for the Deployment Committee meeting. So we'll just call it to order. Today it's at uh, 2.04, so we'll start the meeting now. And the first thing on our agenda is opening up the floor for public comments. So if you'd like to make a comment, please click on the raise hand function in the reactions tab at the top of your screen, and we will call on you for public comment. All right, I am not seeing any hands raised. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next order on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. And we have the minutes from the last meeting, um, which are the minutes from February 23rd, 2022. And is there a motion to approve the minutes? This is Matt, so moved. This is Lonnie, second? I second. I second Great, thank Lonnie. you so much. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay, seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I'm gonna be abstaining. This okay. is I'm sorry, this is Bettina Brown. I, I was not, I'm filling in for Sarah. I was not at that meeting, so I will abstain. Great. Um, before we get to any more abstentions, are there any nays on the on the minutes? No? Okay. No problem. Any other abstentions? All right. I think the motion passes resoundingly. Move on to our next order of business. So this is the um, incentive program updates and recommendations for the Smarty Loan uh, expansion to include environmental infrastructure measures. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so um, just wanted to set some background context uh, coming off of the February uh, of 2022 meeting. Um, so uh, as the board is aware and familiar uh, with the passage of Public Act 21-115, uh, which expanded the scope of the Green Bank beyond clean energy to include environmental infrastructure, uh, we're kind of, this uh, recommendation is coming from that vantage point uh, focused specifically on the Smarty Loan, which I'll get into uh, more detail in a second. Um, per our founding statute, uh, we're required to have a comprehensive plan in place uh, before we um, uh, implement and finance projects, clean energy projects, and in this case, environmental infrastructure projects. So um, the board um, um, approved that comprehensive plan at our July 22nd meeting, uh, and within it, um, there were a number of tasks for fiscal year 23 underneath environmental infrastructure, and uh, they were less targets and more tasks um, as we gradually step into this new frontier. Um, so one of the tasks was launching new products, um, specifically with the focus on e adapting existing products. So uh, the Smarty Loan um, and our CPACE program um, on the CPACE front, uh, there was legislation passed this year expanding its scope to include uh, EV recharging stations that didn't have to have an SIR. Uh, the board look, took a look at that in the October meeting uh, as we went through public review. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the smart e-loan um, and specifically about climate adaptation and resiliency measures within the context of environmental infrastructure. Um, so just taking a step back, uh, we've been implementing the Smarty Loan now for quite some time, almost 10 years. Um, those of you might remember Rima Uweed from the Department of Energy who helped us repurpose our old American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds back in the day. Um, and one of the programs that uh, we launched back then was the Smart E-Loan, which um, at the time focused on using those ARA funds as a loan loss reserve, a second loss reserve. 
Uh, we discovered over time, knock on wood, that uh, those loans performed um, and that we were in, we were, we were going to be in a perpetual quarterly reporting cycle with the federal government because we weren't um, paying out the loan losses because people were paying their, their loans back. Um, so we decided to switch the use of those funds to interest rate buy downs that allowed us to catalyze um, certain segments of the market. More recently, in the last year to two years, um, heat pumps, um, battery storage, EV recharging stations um, at home. Uh, we have uh, 13 participating local lenders, uh, community banks, credit unions, community development financial institutions, uh, who all have engaged in a lending agreement with the Green Bank. Um, I think Bert and I, we were challenged by Commissioner Esty back in 2013 to make sure that this program helped support the implementation of the comprehensive energy strategy. So he wanted, what he was getting at was he wanted to see these loans go further out in tenor uh, beyond five years to seven, 10, 12, 15, 20 years because the useful life of measures like windows, insulation, have longer term uh, useful lives. So the more we could extend the tenor, uh, the lower the monthly debt service costs we could get, and therefore the more measures we can, in support of the comprehensive energy strategy, we could get. So um, Bert established a really great template for uh, those agreements. Um, the Green Bank takes a second loss position with the local community banks and credit unions. Uh, which is to say that they take the first one and a half percent of losses, uh, and then we take the next seven and a half percent. What's been great uh, about this, the structure of this program, is that you know the first one and a half percent of losses. That's typical of what uh, financial institutions uh, expect. So, so we we didn't want to uh, provide them a benefit that they they, they didn't already expect to, to have as a business. Um, we've only had to pay out, uh, I think it's now what, Bert, up to about $300,000 in the ARA funds to pay off loan losses for uh, lenders who have provided over $115 million of, of capital to homeowners. So um, we've been able to support over 6,300 projects, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, solar PV deployment, but a majority of these projects have been more efficient uh, HVAC equipment, weatherization, and more recently heat pumps. So over 85% of the projects have been uh, energy efficiency. Uh, I think we're wrapping up our special offer and the final use of our interest rate buy-down funds from ARA. So we're getting close to expending all of our $8.2 million that we repurposed back in, in 2012. So if we step back and we look at the Smarty Loan as a product that can allow homeowners to, to use to finance environmental infrastructure, we decided to start with the climate adaptation and resiliency aspects of that definition. So um, there are a number of us, we, we call our, ourselves collaborators. Um, the insurance department, uh, which includes George Bradner, um, Circa, the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation at UConn, uh, which includes John Trzinski and Jim O'Donnell, uh, and DEEP, uh, which includes uh, Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca French. Uh, so we all go back a couple of years since the since Connecticut is a member of the United States Climate Alliance, which is a number, I think it's 25 states across the country who were were and are committed to the Paris Agreement. Uh, they represent about 50% of the U.S. population, 60% of the gross national product, and only 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there was an opportunity that came through the U.S. Climate Alliance for states to learn from our European Union colleagues. So uh, Rebecca was like eager. She was like, let's file in uh, an application. Uh, we spent some time over a weekend. We filed in an application, and we were one of four states that was selected uh, to have an exchange with the European Union. So ever since then, we've been like all bonded uh, together as collaborators. And the project that we really dug into and wanted to understand was uh, uh, how to increase our resilience against flooding. Um, specifically, there was a program in Germany around a flood label. So that got us all interested in voluntary measures that homeowners can take 
to improve their resilience against flooding. Uh, I, I think what uh, what George Bradner would say uh, from an insurance perspective is that 90% of the damage from um, hurricanes, heavy rain comes from bad roofs. Um, so we've got coming, you know, water coming down and water coming up. Uh, but uh, uh, we we decided to continue that project after its completion and specifically look at on the residential side here in Connecticut, could we think about a program design structure, a pilot structure that was almost like home energy solutions, but for resilience. So we've, we've, had, we've been working with a contractor that was helping us back then, still helping us today. And one of the tasks of that work was to identify measures in climate resiliency and adaptation that we could recommend uh, be incorporated into the Smart E-Loan program. So that's what we're, we're talking about today. So uh, Taryn Akayama, who uh, you all may have met at our offsite strategic retreat, uh, led the research. Um, she did a lot of literature review, uh, looking at other states um, and localities, um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Alabama, um, spending a lot of time in FEMA documents, the Federal Emergency Management Agency documents, where she found a lot of these measures. So in the materials that we left, there were some 82 measures that were identified. And then Taryn ran those measures and their descriptions by the collaborators and was like, okay, collaborators, what do you think about these measures? And you know, we all have different levels of knowledge. I would say the Green Bank, we probably have the lowest of the group's knowledge on this area. So we really leaned in to our colleagues. Um, and, you know, it was like a yes, no, maybe sort of exercise. So all of our agencies went through that. Um, and from it, there were 31 measures that we're recommending. Um, Taryn did a great job trying to bucket those measures into broader categories. Um, so obviously energy efficiency, we get really well. So there are a few uh, recommendations there that the Smarty Loan already does, uh, insulation, solar PV, heat pumps, uh, but we flagged it. You know, as weather gets hotter, we obviously want more cooler temperatures. As it gets colder, we want warmer temperatures. So we get that temperature on the efficiency side. Uh, landscaping, rain barrels, planting native trees, replacing grass with native plants, tree trimming, like these are all ways that a homeowner can improve the resilience against heavy water um, uh, coming down on their home. Uh, loss prevention, um, you know, elevating service equipment in basements, um, getting them out of the way, um, you know, um, installing battery storage, again, we get that. Um, so uh, making sure that all these technologies are installed properly um, while looking at the floodplain and the flood zone to make sure that we're installing it at a certain level in the event of a water intrusion reductions, lots of interesting things here. There's, there's something called the French drain. I didn't put it on here, but there's all these new things that our collaborators know a lot about and they get it. But, you know, just imagine uh, trying to prevent any sort of water seeping in. I always think of Larry Janeski here, um, all things basement-y when I think of water intrusion. Uh, but, you know, installing sump pumps and, and replacing impervious surfaces and the like and waterproofing, uh, applying water, water seal, wall sealants and the like. So those are the measures. We, we ran those measures by a state group. Um, there is a group of state agencies called SAFER, the State Agencies uh, Fostering Resilience, which includes all the collaborators, but also includes others, Department of Public Health, Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, Department of Transportation. Um, so we ran, we spent uh, an hour with them going through the Smarty Loan, providing them the list. Uh, they gave us real-time feedback on the list. We gave them some time. Uh, DPH was the agency that dug in. Actually, DPH wants uh, uh, water measures. So, so we told them, hold on a sec, we'll come back to you later on water. Right now, we just wanted to get some climate adaptation and resiliency measures in place. So uh, we ground truth the list was safer. But we want to get the gold star. Uh, Dr. Rebecca French really wants to make sure that uh, these measures achieve gold star status. And we think by having FEMA the local FEMA lead take a look, the regional insurance specialist at the list, that he will be able to tell us what measures actually might result 
in a reduction of insurance premiums if homeowners install them. So as we think about energy and reducing energy burden from installing these measures, we could think about climate adaptation and resiliency measures as reducing uh, insurance premiums. Um, so that's kind of, this kind of been the process, you know, amongst the collaborators we worked uh, with with Taryn of Climate Finance Advisors. Uh, we vetted that short list. Uh, we still have one more uh, thing to go with FEMA. Um, so um, the resolution, we're actually proposing an addition to the resolution, which would be that um, the deployment requests the collaborators to seek a final review from FEMA for how this list of measures could benefit insurance. Uh, so you're giving us, you'd give us more guidance to get that gold star status that uh, Dr. French was after. Uh, but le let me stop there. Um, that's the uh, uh, staff recommendation on this set of measures for the Smarty loan underneath environmental infrastructure. We'll be coming back with others in other sectors, but this is the first uh, go. Does anyone have any questions on the presentation? That was excellent. Uh, I, this is Lonnie. I, I just wanted to ask one quick question. So as somebody who lives at the shore, <laughs> which I know Bert does too, um, I know FAME is backing away from a lot of its coverages. And uh, so my, immediately I get concerned, are they going to dump more stuff on us because they're going to be collaborators and consultants? And I'm just wondering if you're seeing any of that. Good question. Um, I don't know, Lonnie. I wish it looked like, um, how do I say this? Like we're as a green bank coming up a learning curve and this area of FEMA, um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, like everything that has to do with resilience and infrastructure building and insurance is really complicated. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm punting a bit, um, but we'll flag that question for um, our insurance team and get back to you. Great, thank you. Um, Ryan, I have, I have a couple questions and maybe that can be an offline discussion. I don't want to take into everyone's time, but I have I have a bunch of uh, questions and concerns before we put these into the Smart E program. They're all great, but you know, I think there are a couple of questions I just didn't see answered. For example, under the state building code, if a project accepts accepts state funds, they actually have to meet a different resiliency requirement for their base flood elevation. So will we be requiring people who access the Smart E loan to meet those uh, more exacting building code standards? Because those may go to the community, uh, the community insurance rating under FEMA as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think we should think about, I don't know if you've collaborated with the Department of Consumer Protection, because a lot of this work will be done through you know, home contractors and whether we want to think about, you know, having some sort of minimum protections in the in the contracts with these with the contractors, because oftentimes, you know, these small projects have they're supposed to have contracts, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they're built to standards. Sometimes there's no requirement in the contract that they be built to comply with the plans. So, you know, I just as we open the door to more of these measures and put our funding behind it, you know, I just want to make sure we get what we pay for type of thing. Um, and there's also, you know, a couple other thoughts I have just having worked in that space a lot. So I'm happy maybe there's someone offline between now and the board meeting. You know, I could just sort of run through some of the um, some of the FEMA and land use uh, uh, parts of this. That would be great, Matt. And like my suggestion would be to get the collaborators together and get that guidance into the collaborators because they really do the shepherding of the right agencies on. And, you know, George Bradner is a big code guy, so he's we need to be up to the current code. And so, yeah, he would be much more proficient. So if I can get you um, engaged there, you know, so, so what we're doing here today is really just. Um, you know, uh, uh, supporting a set of measures that we're then just going to set aside, and then we're going to mm -hmm. try to go back to water and other measures. It's like, um, uh, uh, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? We just want to start getting some of the measures done. So when we're asked, well, what kind of measures can this support? We have something to go from. Okay, so we're Our, not going to be we're not going to be underwriting 
these That's measures. Right. Yeah. Okay, I got you. I got you. And and also, I would just throw in the state building official, and in, in at deep, you know, it was, it was it I think Diane Ifkovic, and probably um, Brian Thompson, who are really fluent in this stuff. No pun intended. <laughs> this is good. Great. Yeah, this is the first time we're going through this kind of like process of vetting. So we'll, as we come through the next set, we'll continue to improve. But um, yeah, Matt, we'll do some follow up with you and the collaborators and, you know, down the chain here with folks. Um, I have a question. Um, to Tina Brown, I've, um, can you just expand a little bit more on what the third resolved um, is looking, what, what you're looking to do there? Okay, so the deployment seeks review and approval of it. Oh, oh, the additional. So right now, underneath the environmental infrastructure, climate adaptation and resiliency is one component. Yep. So we will come back for more components, water, waste and recycling, agriculture, land conservation, parks and recreation. It's likely that some of those components won't have anything, but I think our next area is gonna be water because as we were presenting to the SAFER Council, uh, the Department of Public Health had a number of water measures they wanted to suggest. And we were like, okay, that's great, 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 hold it. Right now we just wanna get adaptation. So we'll, we'll go through this process again with um, uh, DPH on water. Um, so, so that's what this is getting at, is we'll be coming back to you uh, with other segments at a later date. And the goal is to just keep moving more and more measures that we have recommendations for. Then once we have a big enough batch, we will come back with an approach that says, here's how we'll implement the program going forward, which right, I, so, yeah. So this is kind of just instructions to you, the resolve. That's right. That's right. Okay. That's, yeah, it's guiding us. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So Ryan, you're not looking for a motion or anything here, right? Or are you? We are, yeah, if we could. On, okay. on, on this on this resolution with this uh, proposed addition in green. Okay. So looking at resolution number two that's on the screen here, is there anyone who'd like to make a motion on the resolution? This is Lonnie, I'll make a motion. Bettina, a motion second. To approve the resolution? Bonnie. I'm sorry, was your motion to approve the resolution? Oh, yes, to approve the resolution. Okay. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> sorry Any for the discussion on the red on the motion. Seeing none, all those who are in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the resolution number two passes. Great, so moving on to the next order of business, uh, investment updates and recommendations. Great, and I think we're gonna turn it to Desiree Miller and Bert Hunter. Desiree, it's, it's all you. I've got the slides, just let me know. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to meet you. Um, today, I wanted to walk through an investment proposal we are presenting today as part of the Capital Solutions Open RFP program. Energy Resources, which is one of our CPACE installers, approached us as they have been awarded a $2.86 million contract to make energy efficiency improvements at Bradley Airport. Energy Resources needs financing to meet their, their installation costs, essentially equipment and labor, because they only get paid at the very end of the project once the project has um, successfully reached inspection. Um, and the, the job is part of the Small Business Energy Advantage Program, and so Eversource would be um, the party paying, paying energy resources for the work, even though the work's at Bradley. Next, okay, thanks. Um, so to help energy resources meet their obligations, we are proposing to create a construction debt facility. The debt facility would be used to fund 12 energy efficiency measures. So as you see on the slide here, lighting, refrigeration, and HVAC. Um, the construction period would last about 18 months. Um, and the so we're proposing a two-year term for the facility, um, just to add a little bit of cushion in case there are construction delays or the approvals take longer than expected. 
um, as energy resources, again, would only be getting paid after at the completion of installation, um, we're proposing a bullet where all the principal and the interest are paid at the very end at maturity. Um, and as we're in um, open session, I'm not going to get into the, the rates or the, the fees that we're proposing, um, but you can refer back to your memos, um, which, which have all those details there. Um, the security. Um, so in addition to energy resources, obviously being responsible for making making payment on this bullet loan, um, if if there is a default, Eversource um, would be providing collateral assignments to the payments. Um, let's, um, okay, and finally, let's take a look at the bottom of the slide, um, project benefits. Um, the Bradley Airport or the um, Airport Authority is expected to save $5.1 million with these um, energy efficiency improvements over their effective useful life which translates to like about 845,000 MMBTUs, again, over the, the useful life. Um, here's an overview of the transaction. It involves five unique parties. Um, we can jump into the details now. Next slide. Um, Eversource awarded energy resources a $2.86 million contract under the Small Business Energy Advantage Program to install energy retrofits at Bradley. Uh, next slide. Uh, the funding for the project comes from two sources. Um, there's a $1.86 million grant from the Connecticut Energy Efficiency Fund, and then um, the airport authority would be making $1 million of loan payments, um, and then obviously accruing all the benefits in the form of $5.13 million of um, savings, so like a $4.13 million net benefit. So. Clearly a no brainer for the airport authority. Um, there is a capital need here. So as Eversource would only be paying at project completion, obviously the equipment and the vendors need to be paid before project completion. They typically don't like to wait for 18 months to get paid. Um, so that's that's where the capital need comes in. Um, next slide. Um, and then the Green Bank um, can help fill, meet this need by providing energy resources with a $2.5 million um, debt facility um, to meet their, their installation expenses. And um, energy resources would then repay us with principal and interest um, at maturity in the form of a bullet payment. Um, let's take a little bit of a look at energy resources. They're um, an efficiency and in solar installer based in Thomaston, Connecticut. Um, they um, focus on commercial scale customers with a particular focus on government customers, state and unis. And then they also get into you know, regular non-government commercial scale customers, industrial, retail, nonprofits. Um, they participate as a contractor for both Eversource and UI for over 10 years. Um, there you can just see a bit of an alphabet soup of all the state agencies that they've um, performed um, energy efficiency installations. They do some CPACE installations for us. Um, kind of on the larger side, 312,000 was their smallest they've done for us. And then up to 3.1 million. I think on the $3.1 million, they were actually did that um, in conjunction with CTEC. Um, we financed three of their pace deals and then uh, the other four were financed by third party capital providers. Uh, the company is owned by um, primarily owned most of the equity is owned by Rich Cardita, who's the president and Matt James is the CEO. They each own 41% of equity and then five kind of five of their managers own the remaining equity. Uh, next slide. Oh, no, there you are. Um, Again, um, as we're in open session, the I've blurred out the financials, but you can see them in your memos. Um, they're they're in good standing. We we believe them to be in good standing. Gonna move on. And it can go to the resolutions. Um, so I can read out the resolutions, or how does this typically? Should I read it out? Um, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Green Bank approves the capital solutions application of energy resources 
and the establishment of a construction line of credit for funding its obligations under contracts for energy efficiency retrofits for state projects pursuant to the Eversource Small Business Energy Advantage Program in the amount not to exceed two and a half million dollars on terms substantially similar to those described in the deployment committee memo and resolve that the proper green bank officers are authorized and empowered to do all other acts and negotiate and deliver all other documents and instruments as they shall deem necessary and desirable to affect the above mentioned legal instruments any questions yes this is bettina um can you Remind us again what exactly the project at Bradley Airport or projects are. Sure, um, Brian, if you could please scroll up to the second, the grid slide. There is. Um, uh, yeah, so it's lighting, refrigeration and HVAC. It's mostly lighting. Is that at the airport, at the garage, yeah. at the oh. terminal, at the. Oh, let me, one sec, let me just pull that up. I've got it right here. So there. Okay, at the, in the parking lot, two different parking lots, um, outside the road, in the main terminal, the international terminal, in the firehouse, or parking lot lighting. Um, I'm tilting my head because I have this pasted sideways on my document. Um, and then some sort of, you know, smaller outside buildings. So I guess across the entire campus is the. OK, thank you. And I, I had a question was this energy resources USA. Did they like submit an RFP? I mean, how did they were they? selected through a different process outside of our process, I take it, for doing this work. And and if that's the case, what was their original plan to for capital? So they were selected by Eversource to do the work. This isn't our like the 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 project was Eversource's project or, or Eversource runs a small business or Mackie you're interjecting. Yeah. No, uh, they were selected by the the airport authority oh, the as their contract. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's ever source mm -hmm. program. It works different ways depending on the project. In this case, it was the airport authority that uh, that selected them. And, and what was their original when they, I guess, submitted for the RFP or however they did it? How how did they intend to finance the project? Lately, we, credit markets, or do you want to go say, Mark, Mackie, you want to take it? I can try. I, I, I'm, it's going to say I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, the genesis, they approached us, uh, the initial conversation I had with uh, with Matt James and uh, two or three other of their employees. Um, I, I think it might have been a timing thing uh, based the way he portrayed it that, uh, you know, the market conditions in terms of what uh, suppliers are demanding uh, for payment has changed over the course of the last year or so. You know, supply chains have gotten more and more constrained. Um, so my sense is that as, you know, those numbers got higher and higher, they just, you know, they, they were now worried about being able to make the project happen. Yeah, and that, that was just my read of it. I'm not, they didn't, I, it's a good question. Uh, and I didn't ask it when we had that initial conversation, but that was again, that was my sense based on uh, the way they talked about it. Yeah, I'm not sure it matters. I just, I mean, kind of yeah. curious. Big project. Well, they they are a state quasi agency, so uh, I, the RFP thing is that's a good question. If they are the repeated or resources, so. the 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 people do who won the bid are a state agency, or the or the airport authority. Airport authority. Yeah, yeah. No, I was. I, I meant more the uh, contractor, how they intended mm. to capitalize yeah. it. And and also, I mean, they this conversation was in the context of uh, at least one other uh, state project that they they were selected. Uh, they did not get under uh, they did. It was with the Department of Correction. Um, they weren't able to get the documentation yet because there's uh, Kirsten actually probably knows more than I do, but there's some sort of legal prohibition right now about the state 
in and into additional SBEA projects that we're working to, or DEEP is working to resolve. But once that is resolved, uh, we would, Energy Resources anticipates getting at least one other large uh, state project. I think they're hoping for more and, you know, to, to grow this partnership uh, that we would cool. create here. And you know this. I think this is a great. You know, this is all coming from the the work that the Green Bank has already done on the SBEA side, uh, with you know the financing which the state is using here to expand the capital that's available there. So they're able to do more and larger projects because of that. So now we're seeing on the contractor side what has been a fair, you know, a, a group of fairly small to mid-sized Connecticut efficiency businesses that are now able to to get these larger projects. Cool. This is Lonnie. Um, just thinking of the marketing opportunities, I think Bradley was just voted the second best airport in the country by a bunch of Condé Nast traveler folks. And um, I think in the top 10 for the last six years, uh, and the airport authorities done, I mean, they've all done a remarkable job. And, you know, so, and as the public comes back to travel, hopefully, <laughs> um, it just feels like that, you know, it's a place. Ex it's interesting. It's the kind of thing that you can really promote that we had a role in uh, upgrading and taking advantage. And of course, everybody's always complaining about planes and how unzero carbon they are. So we can kind of take credit for stepping in to try to clean up the airport and the uh, and the and the uh, airliner act. Any further questions or comments? All right, if not, I think, is there a motion to approve resolution number three? This is Beno. I move resolution number three for approval. Thank you. Any seconds? This is Matt, second. Great, any discussion? All right, all those who approve of uh, passing resolution number three, please say aye. 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 All those who uh, oppose? Any abstentions? All right, great. Motion passes. Our next order of business is um, financing program updates and recommendations. Cool. And we are going to turn to Alex Kovtenenko, who's going to a review all the great work uh, he and the team have been doing looking at tr the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, Treasury. All right, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, Alex Kovtenenko here, Associate uh, General Counsel for Financing Programs. And yeah, as Brian said, we've been working, uh, Brian Farnan, Bert Hunter, Mackey, and, and the rest of the team, we've all been working past few months to digest the IRA as it's uh, come out and the uh, uh, various uh, uh, now IRS comment process and uh, forthcoming guidance. So we're just tracking that and digesting it as it comes in and wanted to give um, sort of a high level look at um, the, the the tax credits portion of it. I, I believe Brian has already given a presentation on the, um, on the National Green Bank Fund and all the opportunities that affords, uh, but a large part of the IRA is obviously the expansion and extension uh, of the various tax credits and how they affect all of our programs uh, existing and uh, potentially new programs. So um, that's high level. There's a couple novel concepts that, as far as tax credits that were introduced in the IRA, and that's the direct pay election, um, which will allow tax exempt organizations and uh, notably political subdivisions. So uh, us, Connecticut Green Bank, to take um, what otherwise tax exempt entities can't take advantage of the tax credits because they don't have a federal income tax to offset. But here you can take a payment um, the tax exempt entity can take a payment uh, like it uh, akin to a tax refund and direct payment from the IRS instead of taking the credit um, as a taxable entity would. Uh, and that you have a transferability election for certain credits where you can actually one time transfer the credit, uh, can basically sell it to an unrelated third party and tax exempt uh, uh, entities can do that as well. So um, we're, as I said, that we have the CGB Dream Big products team is working to kind of digest these these uh, credits and uh, implement and see how they affect our programs. And I thought I just kind of picked two 
ones that I thought were a good highlight uh, case, then I was going to talk about those, then give a really brief summary of IRS comments that we submitted, as well as kind of what's what we're hearing in the market so far, and um, kind of open it up to any questions or things. We can obviously drill drill down deep into any one of these credits and spend a lot of time in the weeds. So I don't, uh, and I'm, I'm I always welcome that. And if anybody wants to follow up on anything specific, I'm happy to kind of track something down or share our resources. So this is a good one. This is 25 C tax credit, and this, think um, my, we were just talking about the Smart E program, so home energy improvements. This is one that's been expanded and sort of re modified. It, it was previously much lower limits and it was a lifetime uh, limit that a taxpayer could take on their primary residence. It's now an annual limit. Uh, the limits are higher. It's um, $2,000 uh, $2, for heat pumps. It's $1,200 for cumulative for everything else. Again, that's per year. So if you have a um, $600 for other improve uh, the $600 limit, that's think like HVAC improvements. And then you have your window limits and other things. So if you have like a project where you're making an HVAC improvement and insulation in one year, you can hit that $1,200 cap. And then next year, if you want to do heat pumps, you can hit that $2,000 cap. So it really is it is sort of a, is a game changer from that perspective uh, for resident. And this is residential uh, residential uh, primary residences. So that's one. Um, next one is of course uh, our. This is the the big kahuna that we do is the you know, 48, uh, section 48 ITC. This is think solar, wind, fuel cells. Um, is was back to is now back to 30 percent and extended through 2030. It's actually extended. That's uh, that's it's actually extended until there's no specific suns. I think the sunset provision is the earlier of that date versus when um, uh, uh, the uh, electric grid is is. To, to below 25 percent, uh, it's uh, gra greenhouse gas emissions for 22. So it is a, it isn't basically extended until that time that that uh, threshold is reached. And um, the really exciting thing about this is the various adders that you can get. So uh, about first of all, uh, once IRS releases guidance, all projects above one, one megawatt have to meet apprenticeship and uh, prevailing wage requirements. And, and what all of this means is, of course, there's there's a lot in the weeds here for all of these requirements, and that's what the IRS guidance that we'll talk about next is. But at a high level, these you can earn these bonus credits or adders for domestic content, energy communities, and energy communities is uh, basically brownfields or census tracts around retired uh, coal fire plants or uh, certain municipal areas that have uh, historic uh, employment, some historic employment in fossil fuel transportation or storage. So and uh, higher than uh, a certain uh, unemployment threshold. So there is there is some uh, hope that we would have some communities in that uh, that meet that requirement as well. Oh, Brian. I keep going to the end of this slide and I'll, okay. I'll think to the end. Um, so, yeah, the adders are exciting because it, it, you can see that you can Theoretically, you can have a project that's um, domestic content and an energy community. So we know for sure, you know, for example, we have one retired coal fire plant in Bridgeport. We're seeing if uh, the the Mira trashed energy plant will also qualify for that. Um, so we'll definitely have energy communities there. And then if you get the 20 local matter, you're looking at a 70 percent uh, uh, ITC you know, for, for uh, solar uh, fuel cell wind projects. So that's, it, it's hard. Uh, the, the low income adders are actually, um, so that's a program that has an annual limit. It's for projects below one megawatt or five megawatts. Um, the Treasury will ha has until February to establish uh, how the application and allocation of those, uh, that extra credit is prescribed. And um, we'll get into that in the next slide. And again, on this credit, you now have transferability, standalone storage, and our connection that costs now are included. And it, this is going to be replaced by a technology neutral credit uh, 25 going forward. Cool. So, so I, I, ju I just wanted to add on this. Um, you know, these are a couple of use case examples. Um, when Manchin and Schumer reached agreement on this Inflation Reduction Act, I can tell you our team, and when the bill floated through the Senate, 
our team immediately. You could just see the chatter and the excitement of our team because Connecticut, as it is, has really good policy and really good incentives. Um, you know, we have a really ambitious 45% uh, reduction of G greenhouse gas emissions from 2001 levels by 2030. Yeah, that's a diff that's going to be a difficult target to hit. I think with this, it just really energized the group and and the team. Alex, you know, chairing, co-chairing, leading that team of of staff members across the board. Everyone just really dug in, and you can see across the board how something like this, you could see solar going into Bridgeport and in our solar for all with batteries and just almost completely eliminating costs. It, it's just incredible what's happening here. So our team is trying to wrap our arms around how our financing programs can make that journey for the customer very easy. Bert called this the incentive maze because you know it's like there's so many things going on out there that it, it could take a while to help a customer navigate through it. But if we can break all of that by making this process simple, we're really going to see deployment in Connecticut. So Alex is sharing with you the excitement of, of some of these use cases. Just wanted to put that out there, Alex. Yeah, no, thanks, Brian. Uh, and we could go to the next slide. Sp speaking of kind of uh, the, the um, Brian, if you could switch to the next IRS slide. So now we're the a lot of these requirements and how to qualify them for them. I think it's the one before Brian. Oh yeah, gotcha. Uh, so there's a lot of right now. There's a lot of you know uncertainty of how to qualify for certain adders um, in the tax credits timing of. Uh, receiving direct uh, payments, uh, the elective payments. So IRS in October um, uh, put out really broad requests for comments around uh, a, a whole slew of topics uh, that were not not specific, very broad. And, and November 4th was the deadline. We submitted some comments. There were thousands of comments submitted from across industry groups and uh, manufacturers and everything. So uh, we focused, we just tried to, knowing that um, you know, industry groups with the much more uh, brain power to devote to the to the being in the weeds on this would kind of cover a lot of uh, a lot of the basis here. We focus on things that we knew for sure could uh, uh, benefit our programs and here in Connecticut. So the elective uh, payment option, we're seeking clarity on the process of that and timing of that return uh, and making sure and seeing if we can still um, take advantage of that in the various subsidiaries or structures that we as Green Bank can participate in, uh, because obviously the timing of that, you know, um, income return can be very slow and as IRS is not in any deadlines to fulfill those. So that doesn't really work for project finance. And I think that was reflected in a lot of comments that were submitted. Um, energy community definition, uh, the, the brownfield definition, this is the 10% adder for energy communities. Um, again, it's uh, brownfields, certain uh, historic fossil fuel employment areas, and then retired coal fire plant areas. Uh, the brownfield definition is not really clear, and it's uh, it's the EPA one, but it's not all encompassing. So, um, a lot of the ourselves and other stakeholders submitted requesting for the Treasury and IRS to take the broadest view of that and uh, provide a, a way we can actually uh, track those sites, whether it's the uh, EPA tracker or um, you know, if state uh, definitions vary, if we can use that, um, and we and we do want to, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Hopefully, we can get clarity on the coal-fired generating unit of retirement definitions, and if uh, the Mirror facility in Hartford uh, qualifies there, the it's it's a budding census tracks to that, so that would actually put all of downtown Hartford and most of uh, the southern uh, south end of Hartford and energy community to get that 10% adder, which would be uh, huge for deployment in that area. Um, and then the low low income adder, there's a lot of a lot of ourselves and other stakeholders submitted comments, basically urging IRS and Treasury to align with existing state programs as well as uh, make it clear to how taxpayers can demonstrate eligibility and ease of applying for this additional benefit. And if, you know, we they, many states have the low income matters for solar tariffs or other programs, um, making making use of the, that existing infrastructure of programs to qualify for these tax credits. So that's the summary of our comments. 
this is uh, probably a little too in the weeds. Now I'm looking at how much text is on this slide, but I was just trying to uh, kind of looking at other big industry groups and and what what they submitted. Uh, and and so so the timing here is um, there's no clear uh, deadline. The for instance the low co low income adder program there has to, IRA, IRS and Treasury has to put out guidance by I believe early February for that program. Uh, I think. I, I think there's an expectation of uh, guidance coming at the end of this year for certain provisions and then early next year for other provisions. It's not clear if this is going to be, uh, you know, guidance that will be drafted and we'll have be able to comment on. I hope I think that's the hope from everyone for a lot of the complex issues uh, or if, if it'll be formal rulemaking with ability to submit comments or just to notice uh, implementing uh, certain provisions. So. Um, I think the industry is obviously urging for draft guidance that everybody can comment on around the end of the year and and, and final guidance in early next year. Um, and here, yep, yeah, and that, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's going to go into any of the uh, the specific differences there. But in here, I wanted to just kind of highlight a couple of other programs that are in the IRA. Uh, obviously, there's um, there's a, a couple of programs for manufacturers. Um, uh, that you can have a production credit based on uh, uh, manufacturer materials, certain eligible materials that basically go into our components of uh, renewable energy or battery storage or hydrogen um, technology. You have the an increase in the uh, commercial building deduction, uh, which can now be uh, used by tax exempt entities because it can be transferred to the firm that's doing the designing for that uh, energy efficiency upgrade, which is huge. Um, you, then you have this combined total of about nine billion that's going to flow to state energy offices, um, deep in our case, to uh, uh, to S, to supplement um, incentives for low income electrification and other energy efficiency improvements. Uh, so I, I think there'll be forthcoming guidance on that program as well. And um, I, looking at the time, I want to see if you want to open it up to discussion or questions or something like that. That's great. Great summary. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And uh, yeah, so we will have, uh, again, we're kind of Everyone on the team is tr is tracking it in some way, and and we try to put together summaries and applications of these various tax credits. So if you have uh, if you need more information or curious about something, I'm, let us know, and we can try to track it down. Yeah, this is an excellent summary. I'm just excited to see uh, as you learn more about the details, and I uh, know you guys are always brainstorming new and interesting ways of monetizing these. So I'm really excited to see sort of what you come up with. Um, that's great for your report out. Yeah, the crew um, just identified a number of different use cases. They're now going to prioritize those uh, working with DEEP. And the goal is to like have a green storm uh, interagency and kind of go through and get excited together because w this is really a huge opportunity. Like if Connecticut can't realize this by 2030, that no other state's going to be able to realize it. So Alex was alluding to it before. We, we've we created a dream big group as a result that's digging into our products, our people, our plan, you know, and really thinking about a, you know, coming back to the board in January with a bigger vision. Like this just re represents a huge opportunity. So we're really trying to dissect everything here. And again, the easier we could make it on, you know, to customers to participate, uh, the faster we're gonna get acceleration and uptake. Um, Bert. Yeah, I just wanted to, some of you said said this, but uh, a couple of comments here. One is, I, I know this committee recognizes that the, uh, the Green Bank just has an incredibly awesome team of professionals. I mean, I think you're seeing it displayed right here and the amount of, of time and really close scrutiny over all these issues by uh, by the team that has been looking at this has just been, uh, it's been incredible. 
and uh, we're, as Brian mentioned, we're we're rolling this into the 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 dream big big opportunity. There is so much opportunity here, and we're we're just really focused on realizing this. We've we've got the conversations going with deep uh, with the uh, utilities. Um, you know, there's just there's just so much to be done here, but we have to be coordinated, or or you know, we'll just miss so many literally billions of dollars of opportunity that is uh, being rained on us from Washington or kind of rain. It's, it's available. <laughs> you have to know how to, how to get it, but uh, lots to do here, but we're, we're really, uh, the, the whole team is just, the dedication is just incredible here. Yeah. I, I just right. had a long time ago, there were programs, Brian, I remember back when we were CFIA or maybe the Clean Energy Fund, where the federal government would allocate certain amounts of funds to states to use. And there would be years where Connecticut's allocation would go mostly unused or programs we could have qualified things for and didn't. And I think that's what I'm hearing from everybody on the team there is we're not going to leave anything on the table here um, and we shouldn't. So that's great. And we're all excited in our agency. Like we realize that together we can get it. We just have to simplify it for the customers and everyone's working hard to do that. It's cool. It's it's good stuff. All right. Great. I'm just seeing it's close to three and Bettina and I also have a hard stop at three. Did anyone else have any last minute business that they wanted to share before we adjourn? Okay, I'm not hearing any unless um, <laughs> I'm seeing people move. So I'm not sure if... Maybe you can't hear me or not, but uh, I hope everyone can hear me. And thank you so much for a great committee meeting. And we are adjourned as of three o'clock. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.